for the last five weeks, we've been uh, teaching and preaching the message that is probably best told here. Um, the series has been called To Know This Love. It's, it's a line right out of a, a letter that Paul wrote to a, a church in Ephesus. And I think it was because he suspected, I really have, have started to think this about a lot of the letters he wrote. I think that Paul just suspected that as pure as the gospel was when it was beginning, that it would eventually get dirty and stray just the way the Jewish faith had gotten when Jesus showed up. It would turn into something where you could be a good Christian or a bad Christian if you just followed enough of the rules and avoided enough of the other stuff that somehow, and, and, and I think he was right because I think in many cases we have as a church uh, devolved a bit from the original initial purity of the gospel. I think that's why Paul wrote his letters to try to say to the early church, hey, stick to these things because these are the things that will keep the love of God available to the people around I think he had an incredible intent not to let the, the church become um, what it has become in so many ways, um, at least the worst parts of it. I think God smiles uh, upon the church in many ways too because, as I've said before, he has, he has the church as his plan A, and he doesn't have plan B for how he's going to rescue all of humanity. He's counting on us. If you've been on a walk to Emmaus, you've heard those words. Christ is counting on you, but those aren't words just for you on your walk. These are words for all of us. He's counting on us. So he's got us to work with, and, uh, and I know a number of you, and I don't know some of you, um, but some of you come with a reputation. Some of you, it's a reputation that I can't back up, refute, or um, otherwise. Some of you have reputations that I can very much affirm or deny, but I was thinking this week, just as I was preparing for the message, uh, this question, what are you known for? Like you individually, this is like a first person question you would ask yourself. What am I known for? Are you known for something you've accomplished? You know, back when you were a working person. Is it, is it um, are you known for what you do for a living? Are you known for who you're married to or who you used to be married to? Are you known for your parents? Like, do people know you because they know your parents? Or do they know you because they know your children? I mean, sidebar, one of my proudest moments is when someone says, oh, you're Cademan's dad or Kai's dad or Kingston's dad. My good, they haven't embarrassed us or ruined our reputation. <laughs> I love being known as being their dad. Part of my reputation is I am Corey's husband. And I love that. I love that people want to attach me to her because she's really awesome, much better than me in most ways. I love being known in that way. We all have a reputation, a good one or otherwise. And as followers of Jesus, this reputation that we have is so important because it in many ways tells the story of who Jesus is. You know, I found myself asking, how would people know that I have been filled with Christ? Um, how would people know that I follow Jesus? Um, how would people know that I have come to know this love and welcomed it into myself? How would people know that? And then I wonder about it for you. How would people know? It's got to be more than the fact that you showed up here instead of somewhere else on a Sunday morning. It's got to be more than that, right? I think Paul, in all of his teachings that we've been going through over the last number of weeks, he wanted us to be known. Uh, he wanted us to be known as people who were filled with the spirit of Jesus. We had been marked by the love of God and allowed that love to enter us. This is what he wanted for us. In fact, that's where we started this whole series in Ephesians so I want to remind you of the prayer that he was praying for those in the early church, and it's the prayer that I've been praying for you, the current church. Remember these words, where he said, for this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. 
And I pray that out of his glorious riches, he would strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. I think when you read a prayer like that and you read some of the other teachings that he's offered, Paul really believed that this would be possible. I think he really believed that a, that a life that intersected with Jesus could be changed. It could be ultimately filled with the love of Jesus. I think he really believed this. And, and, and I wanna say that I'm convinced it's possible too. You may ask, what convinces you? Well, I've seen it with my own eyes. Especially on a day like today, on Mother's Day. If you were raised by someone who was a mom, not a mother, not a I gave birth and, and then gave up my responsibilities or duties, but most of us had a mom. And we saw in her what Paul is wanting for us. A person who was filled with deep love. A person who lived sacrificially for the sake of others. Putting themselves last so that others could go first. Good moms were those that offered words of encouragement when others were offering words that were not kind. We didn't think we were good at something. Mom was the one who said, you can do it. Mom was the one who would comfort you when you were hurting. Your feelings were hurt or your body was hurt. Mom was typically the first one who would come along. She was the one who loved you or loves you when everyone else walked away. It's possible to have this kind of love in us. We've seen it or we see it now in the moms around us. But the reality is in this room, and maybe some of you dads like, well, what about us? Like, well, Father's Day's coming and there won't be near as much pomp and circumstance. Uh, maybe you'll get a golf ball or a new grilling tool, I don't know. But we'll worry about that when we get to June. We can't all be moms, we can't. And on Mother's Day, it's always also a little bit uh, difficult to celebrate moms because there are amongst us folks who've always wanted to be a mom and never were able. Women who, who wanted to be moms, but for one reason or another, it just wasn't in the life that the Lord had for you. Many of us in the room, I wish we had our mothers, our moms. And time and circumstance and illness and geography has us separated from them. Today's a tender day. We can't all be moms, but we can all be people who are known in a similar light as we would think about our own moms. We could be people who are known for the same things, the things that Paul is instructing and the things that Paul is praying for us. But here's the reality. We Christians, we who in the room would, would attest and affirm that we are followers of Jesus, uh, we're also known for stuff. Now, <laughs> in a recent survey, they surveyed believers and asked what are Christians known for, and then they surveyed non-believers, what are Christians known for. And you might not be surprised, or maybe you would be, that the top three words in those descriptions were vastly different. See, we Christians are known for something. Here's what we think we're known for. The three top were we are giving people, we are compassionate people, we are loving people. Pat yourself and the people around you on the back. That's what we think about ourselves. But more often than not, not only in this case, but in most cases, we think much more highly of ourselves than we ought. That's why the Bible teaches against that. Because if you talk to a non-believer or a believer in another faith, here's the top three words they offer. Judgmental. Hypocritical. Self-righteous. 
not exactly the three things I want to be known for. But every time a non-Christian experiences a Christian and they experience these three things, it becomes my reputation. And so it's on me not to be these things, but rather to be the things that I want to celebrate about us (laughs) being giving and compassionate and loving. This is what I want to be known for, but I'm a Christian, and so I get lumped in with all the rest of y'all. And you're a Christian, and you get lumped in with all the rest of us. So how do we fix this? Well, all y'all and all of us, that's why we spent five weeks on this. We need the love of Jesus in us. We need to welcome the love of God into us. We need to to consider that the journey with Jesus is not a journey towards a list of to-dos and to-don'ts. But the journey with Jesus is a relational journey. Welcoming him in, becoming more like him, spending more time with him so that, like Paul said, when people see us, we can proclaim, it's not I who live but it's Christ who lives in me. And we wouldn't, have to, we wouldn't have to prove it with our words. As I heard someone once say, your life is so loud, I can't hear a word that you're saying. We can welcome this love into us. And that love can take over. It comes as a gift. But you gotta receive it. You gotta welcome it. You gotta unwrap it from time to time so that others can see what you got. Like you would at Christmas or a baby shower. There was a time when a church, a collection of people were known exactly as I long for our church to be known. And it shows up in another letter that Paul writes. This time he writes it with one of his buddies, Timothy. He talks about uh, in his letter to a church that he had never been to before. He did not start this church. He was in prison writing a letter to a church he'd never been to before. He only knows this church by their reputation. And this is what he says. In Colossians chapter one, when he says we, he's talking about he and and Timothy and maybe some of the other prisoners too. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. Sidebar, we we think, theologians believe, that maybe this Epaphras could have been the one who started this church. I don't know for sure, but it seems like it. And he's brought news to Paul and Timothy, which has resulted in this letter. Paul continues. He says, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. There, right there, In verse four, Paul says, we've heard of you. We've been hearing about you. And what we're hearing, this reputation that you have, is that you have such great faith and great love. Oh, it makes us so excited to know that you, as you gather in this early form of Christian community, that the things you're known for are faith and love. Now, as I'm reading this, I'm like, hey, no mention of the pastor? How about the worship leader? He's good. I mean, when people hear of our church, what are they saying about us when they talk about our church? 
I'll tell you what, I'd exchange that they heard about our faith and our love. I'll exchange that for, hey, I heard you have that pastor, or I, I heard you had that great program, or I even heard you had a great fish fry. Like, I would so love it if this community and anyone who talks about us doesn't start with those things, but instead they would talk about your faith and your love. It says here that in verse six that you have heard and you truly understand God's grace. And I found myself in this letter wondering, Parker, you've had eight to nine years with these people. Have they grown? Are they growing in the the understanding of God's grace? Do they get it? Have Have they been completely convinced that it's not how hard they try at this, but how far God was willing to go to love them and to rescue them and to set them free? Like, Do they know that yet? And I think that sometimes we have some, we still have some room to grow. And being completely convinced that this whole thing is not about getting your act together or pretending to have your act together on a Sunday morning. Nor is it a place to walk into a room and go, I can't believe they're here. (laughs) If everybody knew how they lived during the week. And all of that's present in this room. Some of it has even been verbalized to me. Which reminds me, Brent, we have work to do. To create a space where the Holy Spirit can fall on a collection of people and remind them. Remind them why we gather. There's only one reason to, we, that we gather is to glorify the Lord. To acknowledge him in our presence. To steward the work of the Holy Spirit amongst us. Not to try to create some fanatical experience of God, but to acknowledge that God is with us. To point it out as we see him. We would leave changed. This is the grace of God is that he initiated this relationship in the first place. It's it's almost uh, crazy to imagine that the one who knows us best loves us the most. The one who knew us first will be the one who loves us till the end. It's amazing. It's the gospel. Paul and Timothy, in, in trying to be an encouragement to them, if you continue reading through that letter, you'll, you'll find that he was asking for wisdom and the, and the knowledge of God's will. We all are longing for more of that. They prayed that, that these lives would be pleasing and fruit-bearing. And then they prayed for endurance and patience as we walked along the way of Jesus. Because they knew, like you know, like I know, this ain't easy. It's not easy to know that Jesus lives in you. It's not easy to remember that it's not about what I say or do. It's about, hey, Lord, what should I say and or do? I mean, wouldn't it be great if our church was known in the way that this church was known? I mean, I've just been thinking about that and, and throughout this week, thinking about why, what makes me most proud of being associated with you. I was saying to someone recently, everything I say or do becomes your reputation. But the truth of the matter is, everything you say and do becomes mine too. Like we're in this thing together. And I can promise you that I'd much rather be known as, oh, you go to the church at Wood Forest? Oh, that's the church that comes over to Stewart every month and feeds the teachers on payday. They're the ones who have offered encouragement to students and reading books to them and offering mentorship to them. It has nothing to do with our Sunday morning. I would love for people when they talk about the church of Woodforce to say, you know what, I was introduced to that church when my house flooded during Harvey. They showed up, they didn't even know us and they were helping us muck out our house and carry things out to the street and when, when everything was better, they helped us move things back in. I'd like us to be known for that. Oh, you go to the church of Wood Forest? You know what? When my neighbor was struggling through their cancer diagnosis and all of their treatments, it was your church, I'm pretty sure, who was bringing meals to them every other day for two weeks. That's the church you go to? Your faith, your love on display. That's what I long for. Wait a second. Y'all are the church when my neighbor passed away and didn't have a church. You did their service. 
And your church people, who didn't even know the person either, served out there with cookies and water and such great hospitality. That's what I want to be known for. There's a funny thing happened a few weeks ago on a Sunday morning that I want to be known for too. This young man named Ethan, he's like elementary age. He caught me before service and he said, hey, pastor, I wanted to let you know uh, there's a person who's new. They're brand new today. They came for the first time with, a, with their young child and um, I introduced them to the church. I was like, oh, great. He says, I want to make sure you get to meet them when the service is over. Great, I can't wait to. Not knowing that when the service was over, a woman would come to the front and say, I got to tell you how much I love the hospitality of your church. I had a little boy meet me at the front door. He identified that I was new. I don't know if I had a sign on my head, but it was my first Sunday here. <laughs> Maybe I looked lost, but it was my first Sunday. And he came over to me and he introduced himself to me and he took me on a tour of the building. He helped me get my child checked in. He showed me where the coffee and the donuts were and how I could get as many as I want. It's... And then he said he wanted a, my family to sit with him, with them. And, and when, when this young man, I found this out later, when the young man couldn't be found during the first parts of worship, he was sitting with her. Man, what if we were that church? You know, your faith, your love, your hospitality to all people as if you were entertaining angels unaware. I love being a part of that church. I mean, what do you want to be known for at the end of the day? Because there will be an end of the day for all of us. End of the day for you individually and uh, in some ways, maybe, an end of the day for us collectively, but I think more individually is where my, where my mind has been going. Because I've stood at the front of the church, this one and others, and at the end of the line, at the end of the day, and I've heard uh, beautiful things spoken about people we were celebrating. And I've heard others where we were just trying to find a way to make this person more than just they worked really hard and they had fast cars and they had the vacation homes and the, their kids were really talented at stuff. We gotta want more than that, right? I wanna be known for more than that, right? Known for more than what I do, more than what I've done, but how I lived. So this morning, I just wanna invite you to consider uh, this truth that I found in the scriptures as we wrap up this series. Um, and at the risk of you running off to do goodism, just a simple reminder. I can do all things with Christ and I can do nothing without him. It's the truth of the Bible. Attached to him, I can do all things. His spirit can live in me and flow through me and apart from him, I can do nothing. I might as well be a, a broken limb on a tree that's got no more nutrient and thrown in the brush fire. We need Jesus. And whether you like it or not or want it or not, you do too. Every one of you. You need him. And if you don't know him and you don't have him, um, I'm not gonna let this morning go by without you having a shot. It's just the very simple, it's very simple. <laughs> Honestly, it just, it's not easy, but it's simple. Because you gotta be humble. You gotta be humble. You gotta be a bit trusting. So we won't make you do it with your eyes open and your hands raised and coming to the front. We'll just do it quietly. Quiet humility is a little easier than public humility sometimes. So let's pray just as we close. God, deep down, deep down we wanna be known as a good person, I think. I think most of us wanna be known as a good person. The problem is, uh, God, and I've experienced this in my own life, that I will never be good enough. And if my whole goal in life is to be known as a good person, I'm gonna be trying really hard every day, hoping not to make any mistakes, hoping not to fall short in my effort to be a good person. And God, some of us in the room, when we became a Christian, we, we told ourselves, I'm gonna be a good Christian. I'm gonna do what Christians do. I'm not going to drink or smoke or dance or hang around with people who do those things. I'm going to be at church every Sunday and sign up for every Bible study. and I'm going to learn all I can and I'm going I'm to know more than everybody around me. 
I'm gonna get all the gold stars that they hand out for that little chart. And in both cases, we find ourselves here today realizing that we would never be good enough. Never. Good enough without Jesus, good enough with Jesus. But that's where the, where the beautiful thing shows up. Because of Jesus, we are good enough. God, you make us good enough. You called us good, and then you bring your righteousness, and you give it to us as a gift. You forgive everything that we've ever said or done, and you set us right. You give us opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to know this love, to receive this love, to be transformed by this love. Try to remind us, this, this whole relationship is not about what you can do for me. It's about acknowledgement of what I've done for you, and it's about permission of letting me do it through you again. God, no doubt in this room and watching online are people who, um, who thought the whole Christian thing was fooey. Some of the weak-minded people say yes to so they can get into heaven. And they're not all wrong. And I gotta believe this is more than just about getting into heaven. That walking with you and knowing your love is, is about waking up every morning, realizing we're not alone. Waking up every morning before we do anything knowing that you're pleased with us. It's waking up every morning if we, if we feel like we've somehow far, like just exceeded your grace to be reminded that you hunt until you find us and you search until you find us. And when you do, you celebrate. God, I'm believing that there's a son or daughter you've been looking for. You've been hunting trying to find them, trying to get them to see you, not so you can punish them or scold them, but so that you can pick them up and hold them and love them and forgive them and welcome them home. And if there's anyone in this room who, who that's, that's the gift that's being received right now, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God for your mercy, your grace. My prayer is simply that they wouldn't leave the room without telling somebody. Go to the prayer room, come to me. Go to somebody, the person sitting beside you, and just let them know. You, you haven't figured it all out. It's not all making sense yet, but, but you know you need Jesus. Don't leave without that acknowledgement. God, we give thanks for your presence in this room today. I'm so convinced that you were with us. Thank you for it. Thank you in Jesus' name.